This is the reading of I Know Why the Caged Bird Sings by Maya Angelou. I shall be reading for your hearing chapters 19, 20, and 21. The last inch of space was filled. Yet people continued to wedge themselves along the walls of the store. Uncle Willie had turned the radio up to its last notch so that youngsters on the porch wouldn't miss a word. Women sat on kitchen chairs, dining room chairs, stools, and upturned wooden boxes. Small children and babies perched on every lap available, and men leaned on the shelves or on each other. The apprehensive mood was shot through with shafts of gaiety as a black sky is streaked with lightning. I ain't worried about this fight. Joe's going to whip that cracker like it's open season. He's going to whip him till that white boy call him mama. And at last, the talking was finished and the string along songs about razor blades were over and the fight began. A quick jab to the head. In the store, the crowd grunted. A left to the head, and a right, and another left. One of the listeners cackled like a hen and was quiet. They're in a clinch. Lewis is trying to fight his way out. Some bitter comedian on the porch said, That white man don't mind hugging that nigga now, I bet you. The referee is moving in to break them up. But Lewis finally pushed the contender away, and it's an uppercut to the chin. The contender is hanging on. Now he's backing away. Lewis catches him with a short left to the jaw. A tide of murmuring ascent poured out the doors and into the yard. Another left, and another left. Lewis is saving that mighty right. The mother in the store had grown into a baby roar and it was pierced by the clang of a bell and the announcers, that's the bell for round three, ladies and gentlemen. As I pushed my way into the store, I wondered if the announcer gave any thought to the fact that he was addressing as ladies and gentlemen all the Negroes around the world who sat sweating and praying glued to their master's voice. There were only a few calls for R.C. Colas, Dr. Peppers, and Hires Root Beer. The real festivities would begin after the fight. Then, even the old Christian ladies who taught their children and tried themselves to practice turning the other cheek would buy soft drinks, and if the Brown Bomber's victory was a particularly bloody one, they would order peanut patties and baby roots also. Bailey and I lay the coins on top of the cash register. Uncle Willie didn't allow us to ring up sales during the fight. It was too noisy and might shake up the atmosphere. When the gong rang for the next round, we pushed through the near sacred quiet to the herd of children outside. He's got Lewis against the ropes, and now it's a left to the body and a right to the ribs, another right to the body. It looks like it was low. Yes, ladies and gentlemen, the referee is signaling, but the contender keeps raining the blows to Lewis. It's another to the body, and it looks like Lewis is going down. My race groaned. It was our people falling. It was a, another lynching. Yet another black man hanging on a tree. One more woman ambushed and raped. A black boy whipped and maimed. It was hounds on the trail of a man running through slimy swamps. It was a white woman slapping her maid for being forgetful. The men in the store stood away from the walls and, and at attention. Women greedily clutched the babes on their laps while on the porch, the shufflings and smiles Flirtings and pinching of a few minutes before we're gone. This might be the end of the world. If Joe lost, we were black, we were back in slavery and beyond hell. It would all be true. 
the accusations that we were lower types of human beings, only a little higher than the apes. True, that we were stupid and ugly and lazy and dirty and unlucky and worst of all, that God himself hated us and ordained us to be the hewers of wood and drawers of water forever and ever world without end. We didn't breathe. We didn't hope. We waited. He's off the ropes, ladies and gentlemen. He's moving toward the center of the ring. There was no time to be relieved. The worst might still happen. And now it looks like Joe is mad. He's caught Carnera with a left hook to the head and a right to the head. It's a left jab to the body and another left to the head. There's a left cross and a right to the head. The contender's eye is bleeding and he can't seem to keep his block up. Lewis is penetrating every block. The referee is moving in. But Lewis sends a left to the body, and it's the uppercut to the chin, and the contender is dropping. He's on the canvas, ladies and gentlemen. Babies slid to the floor as women stood up and men leaned toward the radio. Here's the referee. He's counting. One, two, three, four, five, six. Seven. Is the contender trying to get up again? All the men in the store shouted, no. Eight, nine, ten. There were a few sounds from the audience, but they seemed to be holding themselves in against tremendous pressure. The fight is all over, ladies and gentlemen. Let's get the microphone over to the referee. Here he is. He's got the brown bomber's hand. He's holding it up. Here he is. Then the voice. Husky and familiar came to wash over us. The winner and still heavyweight champion of the world, Joe Lewis. Champion of the world. A black boy. Some black mother's son. He was the strongest man in the world. People drank Coca-Colas like Ambrosia and ate candy bars like Christmas. Some of the men were, went behind the store and poured white lightning in their soft drink bottles and a few of the bigger boys followed them. Those who were not chased away came back blowing their breath in front of themselves, blowing their breath in front of themselves like proud smokers. It would take an hour or more before the people would leave the store and head for home. Those who lived too far had made arrangements to stay in town. It wouldn't do for a black man and his family to be caught on a lonely country road on the night when Joe Lewis had proved that we were the strongest people in the world. Akabaka soda cracker. Akabaka boo. Akabaka soda cracker. I'm in love with you. The sounds of tag beat through the trees while the top branches waved in contractile rhythms. I lay on a moment of green grass and telescoped the children's game to my vision. The girls ran about wild. Now here, now there. Never here, never was. They seemed to have no more direction than a splattered egg. But it was a shared, if seldom voiced knowledge that all movements fitted and worked according to a larger plan. I raised the platform for my mind's eye and marveled down on the outcome of Akabaka. The gay picnic dresses dashed, stopped, and Started like beautiful dragonflies over a dark pool. The boys, black whips in the sunlight, popped between the trees where their girls had fled, half hidden and throbbing in the shadows. The summer picnic fish fry in the clearing by the pond was the biggest outdoor event of the year. Everyone was there. All churches were represented, as well as the social groups, Elks, Eastern Star, 
Masons, Knights of Columbus, Daughters of Pythias, professional people, Negro teachers from Lafayette County, and all the excited children. Musicians brought cigar box guitars, harmonicas, juice harps, combs wrapped in tissue paper, and even bathtub bases. The amount and variety of foods would have found approval on the menu of a Roman epicure. Pans of fried chicken covered with dish towels sat under benches next to a mountain of potato salad crammed with hard-boiled eggs. Whole rust red sticks of bologna were clothed in cheesecloth. Homemade pickles and chow chow and baked country hams aromatic with cloves and pineapples vied for prominence. Our steady customers had ordered cold watermelons, so Bailey and I chugged a striped green fruit into Coca-Cola box and filled all the tubs with ice as well as the big black wash pot that Mama had used to boil her laundry. Now, they too lay sweating in the happy afternoon air. The summer picnic gave ladies a chance to show off their baking hands. On the barbecue pit, chickens and spare ribs sputtered in their own fat and a sauce whose recipe was guarded in the family like a scandalous affair. However, in the ecumenical light of the summer picnic, every true baking artist could reveal her prize to the delight and criticism of the town. Orange sponge cakes and dark brown mounds dripping Hershey's chocolate stood layer to layer with ice white coconuts and light brown caramels, pound cakes sagged with their buttery weight and small children could no more resist licking the icings than their mothers could avoid slapping the sticky fingers. Proven fishermen and weekend amateurs sat on the trunks of a tree at the pond. They pulled the struggling bass and the silver perch from the swift water. A rotating crew of young girls scaled and cleaned the catch, and busy women in starched aprons salted and rolled the fish in cornmeal, then dropped them in Dutch ovens, trembling with boiling fat. On the corner of the clearing, a gospel group was rehearsing. Their harmony, packed as tight as sardines, floated over the music of the country singers and melted into the songs of the small children's ring games. Boys, don't chew, let that ball fall on none of my cakes. Boys, don't you let that ball fall on none of my cakes. You do, and it'll be me on you. Yes, ma'am, and nothing changed. The boys continued hitting the tennis ball with palely snatched from a fence and running holes in the ground, colliding with everyone. I had wanted to bring something to read, but Mama said if I didn't want to play with the other children, I could make myself useful by cleaning fish and bringing water from the nearest well or wood for the barbecue. I wandered into a retreat by accident. Signs and arrows around the barbecue pit pointed men, women, children toward fading lanes growing over since last year. Feeling ages old and very wise at 10, I couldn't allow myself to be found by small children squatting behind the tree. Neither did I have the nerve to follow the arrow pointing the way for women. If any grown up had caught me there, it was possible that she'd think I was being womanish and would report me to mama. And I knew that I knew what I could expect from her. So when the urge hit me to relieve myself, I headed toward another direction. Once through the wall of sycamore trees, I found myself in a clearing 10 times smaller than the picnic area and cool and quiet. And my busyness was taken care of. I found a seat between two protruding roots of black walnut tree and leaned back on its trunk. Heaven would be like that for the deserving, maybe California too. Looking straight up at the uneven circle of sky, I began to sense that I might be falling into a blue cloud far away. 
the children's voices and the thick order of food cooking over open fire were the hooks I grabbed just in time to save myself. Grass squeaked and I jumped at being found. Louise Kendricks walked into my grove. I didn't know that she too was escaping the gay spirit. We were the same age and she and her mother lived in a neat little bungalow behind the school. Her cousins, who were in our age group, were wealthier and fairer, but I had secretly believed Louise to be the prettiest female in stamps next to Mrs. Flowers. What you doing sitting here by yourself, Marguerite? She didn't accuse me. She asked for information. I said that I was watching the sky. She said, what for? There was obviously no answer to a question like that, so I didn't make up one. Louise reminded me of Jane Eyre. Her mother lived in reduced circumstances, but she was genteel. And though she worked as a maid, I decided she should be called a governess and did so to Bailey and myself. Who could teach a romantic, dreamy 10-year-old to call a spade a spade? Mrs. Kendricks could not have been very old, but to me, all people over 18 were adults, and there could be no degree given or taken. They had to be catered to and pampered with politeness. Then they had to stay in the same category of look-alike, sound-alike, being-alike. Louise was a lonely girl. Although she had plenty of playmates and was a ready partner for any ring game in the schoolyard, her face, which was long and dark chocolate brown, had a thin sheet of sadness over it, as light but as permanent as the viewing gauze on a coffin. And her eyes, which I thought her best feature, shifted quickly as if what they sought had just a second before eluded her. She had come near and the spotted light through the trees fell on her face and braids and running splotches. I had never noticed before, but she looked exactly like Bailey. Her hair was good, more straight than kinky, and her features had the regularity of objects placed by a careful hand. She looked up. Well, you can't see much sky from here. Then she sat down, an arm away from me. Finding two exposed roots, she laid thin wrist on them as if she had been in an easy chair. Slowly, she leaned back against the tree. I closed my eyes and thought of the necessity of finding another place and the unlikelihood of there being another with all the qualifications that this one had. There was a little peal of a scream, and before I could open my eyes, Louise had grabbed my hand. I was falling! She shook her long braids. I was falling in the sky. I liked her for being able to fall in the sky and admit it. I suggested, let's try together. But we have to sit up straight on the count of five. Louise asked, want to hold hands? Just in case? I did. If one of us did happen to fall, the other could pull her out. After a few near tumbles into eternity, both of us knew what it was. We laughed at having played with death and destruction and escaped. Louise said, let's look at that old sky while we're spinning. We took each other's hands in the center of the clearing and began turning around. Very slowly at first, we raised our chins and looked straight at the seductive patch of blue. Faster, just a little faster, then faster, faster yet. Yes, help! We were falling. Then eternity won after all. We couldn't stop spinning or falling until I jerked out of her grasp by greed, till I was jerked out of her grasp by greedy gravity and thrown to my fate below. No, above, not below. I found myself safe and dizzy at the foot of the sycamore tree. Louise had ended on her knees at the other side of the grave, at the other side of the grove. This was surely the time to laugh. 
We lost, but we hadn't lost anything. First, we were giggling and crawling drunkenly toward each other, and then we were laughing out loud uproariously. We slapped each other on the back and shoulders and laughed some more. We had made a fool or a liar out of something, and didn't that just be all? and daring to challenge the unknown with me. She became my first friend. We spent tedious hours teaching ourselves the toot language. You yak o you, no cock nuggle quug. What whack hash a tut? Since all the other children spoke pig Latin, we were superior because tut was harder to speak and even harder to understand. At last, I began to comprehend what girls giggled about. Louise would rattle off a few sentences to me in the unintelligible tut language and would laugh. Naturally, I laughed too, snickered really, understanding nothing. I don't think she understood half of what she was saying herself. But after all, girls have to giggle. And after being a woman for three years, I was about to become a girl. In school, one day, a girl whom I barely knew and had scarcely spoken to and had scarcely spoken to brought me a note. The intricate fold indicated that it was a love note. I was sure she had the wrong person, but she insisted. Picking the paper loose, I confessed to myself that I was frightened. Suppose it was somebody being funny. Suppose the paper would show a hideous beast and the word you written over it. Children did that sometimes. Just because they claimed I was stuck up. Fortunately, I had got permission to go to the toilet, an outside job. And in the reeking gloom, I read, Dear friend, MJ, times are hard and friends are few. I take great pleasure in writing to you. Will you be my valentine, Tommy Valden? I pulled my mind apart. Who? Who was Tommy Valden? Finally, a face dragged itself from my memory. He was the nice looking brown skinned boy who lived across the pond. As soon as I had pinned him down, I began to wonder, why? Why me? Was it a joke? But if Tommy was the boy I remembered, he was a very sober person and a good student. Well, then it wasn't a joke. All right. What evil, dirty things did he have in mind? My questions fell over themselves and army in retreat, haste, dig for cover. Protect your flanks. Don't let the enemy close the gap between you. What did a valentine do anyway? Starting to throw the paper in the foul smelling hole, I thought of Louise. I could show it to her. I folded the paper back in the original creases and went back to class. There was no time during the lunch period since I had to run to the store and wait on customers. The note was in my sock. And every time mama looked at me, I feared that her church gaze might have turned into x-ray vision and she could not only see the note and read its message, but would interpret it as well. I felt myself slipping down a sheer cliff of guilt. And a second time, I nearly destroyed the note. But there was no opportunity. The take-up bell rang and barely raced me to school, so the note was forgotten. But serious business is serious, and it had to be attended to. After classes, I waited for Louise. She was talking to a group of girls laughing, but when I gave her our signal, two waves of the left hand, she said goodbye to them and joined me in the road. I didn't give her the chance to ask what was on my mind, her favorite question. I simply gave her the note. Recognizing the fold, she stopped smiling. We were in deep waters. She opened the letter and read it aloud twice. 
Well, what do you think? I said, what do I think? That's what I'm asking you. What is there to think? Looks like he wants to looks like he wants you to be his Valentine. Louise, I can read. But what does it mean? Oh, you know, his Valentine. His love. There is the hateful word again. That treacherous word that yawned up at you like a volcano. Well, I won't. Most decidedly, I won't. Not ever again. Have you been his Valentine before? What do you mean, never again? I couldn't lie to my friend, and I wasn't about to fresh an old ghost. Well, don't answer him then. And that's the end of it. I was a little relieved that she thought it could be gotten rid of so quickly. I tore the note in half and gave her a part. Walking down the hill, we minced the paper in a thousand shreds and gave it to the wind. Two days later, a monitor came into my classroom. She spoke quietly to Miss Williams, our teacher. Miss Williams said, class? I believe you remember that tomorrow is Valentine's Day, so named for St. Valentine the Martyr, who died around AD 270 in Rome. The day is observed by exchanging tokens of affection in cards. The eighth grade children have completed theirs, and the monitor is acting as mailman. You will be giving cardboard, ribbon, and red tissue paper during the last period today so that you may make your gifts. Glue and scissors are here at the work table. Now stand when your name is called. She had been shuffling the colored envelopes and calling names for some time before I noticed I had been thinking of yesterday's plain invitation and the expeditious way Louise and I took care of it. We, who were being called to receive Valentine's, were only slightly more embarrassed than those who sat and watched as Miss Williams opened each envelope. Helen Gray, Helen Gray, a tall, dull girl from Louisville flinched. Dear Valentine, Miss Williams began reading the badly rhymed childish dribble. I seized with shame and anticipation and yet had time to be offended as the silly poetry that I could have bettered in my sleep. Marguerite and Johnson. My goodness, this looks more like a letter than a valentine. Dear friend, I wrote you a letter and saw you tear it up with your friend, Miss L. I don't believe you meant to hurt my feelings. So whether you answer or not, you will always be my Valentine TV. Class, Miss Williams smirked and continued lazily without giving us permission to sit down. Although you are only in the seventh grade, I'm sure you wouldn't be so presumptuous to sign a letter with an initial. But here is a boy in the eighth grade about to graduate. Blah, blah, bluey, blah. You may collect your valentines and these letters on your way out. It was a nice letter. Tommy had beautiful penmanship. I was sorry I tore up the first. His statement that whether I answered him or not would not influence his affection reassured me. He couldn't be after, you know. What if he talked like that? I told Louise that the next time he came to the store, I was going to say something extra nice to him. Unfortunately, the situation was so wonderful to me that each time I saw Tommy, I melted in delicious giggles and was unable to form a coherent sentence. After a while, he stopped including me in his general glances. Bailey stuck branches in the ground behind the house and covered them with a worn through blanket, making a tent. It was to be his Captain Marvel hideaway. 
There he initiated girls into the mysteries of sex. One by one, he took the impressed, the curious, the adventurous into the green shadows and explaining that they were going to play mama and papa. I was assigned the role of baby and lookout. The girls were commanded to pull up their dresses and then he lay on top and wiggled his head. I sometimes had to lift the flap our signal that an adult was approaching. And so I saw their pathetic struggles, even as they talked about school in the movies. He had been playing the game for about six months before he met Joyce. She was a country girl, about four years older than Bailey. He wasn't quite 11 when they met, whose parents had died and she, along with her brothers and sisters, had been parceled out to relatives. Joyce had come to Stamps to live with the widowed aunt, who was even poorer than the poorest person in town. Joyce was quite advanced physically for her age. Her breasts were not the hard little knots of other girls her age. They filled out the tops of her skimpy little dresses. She walked stiffly as if she were carrying a load of wood between her legs. I thought of her as being coarse, but Bailey said she was cute and that he wanted to play house with her. In a special way of women, Joyce knew she had made a conquest and managed to hang around the store in the late afternoons and all day Saturdays. She ran errands for mama when we were busy in the store and sweated profusely. Often when she came in after running down the hill, her cotton dress would cling to her thin body and Bailey would glue his eyes on her until her clothes dried. Mama gave her small gifts of food to take to her aunt. And on Saturdays, Uncle Willie would sometimes give her a dime for show fare. During Passover week, we weren't allowed to go to the movies. Mama said we all must sacrifice to purify our souls. And Bailey and Joyce decided that the three of us would play house. As usual, I was to be the baby. He strung the tent and Joyce crawled in first. Bailey told me to sit outside and play with my doll baby and went in and the flat closed. Well, ain't you going to open your trousers? Joyce's voice muffled. No, you just pull up your dress. There was rustling sounds from the tent and the sides pooched out as if they were trying to stand up. Bailey asked, what are you doing? Pulling off my drawers. What for? We can't do it with my drawers on. Why not? How are you going to get it in? Silence. My poor brother didn't know what she meant. I knew. I lifted the flap and said, Joyce, don't you do that to my brother. She nearly screamed, but she kept the voice low. Margaret, you close that door, Billy added. Yes, close it. You're supposed to be playing with our doll baby. I thought he would go to the hospital if he let her do that to him. So I warned him. Billy, if you let her do that to you, you'll be sorry. But he threatened that if I didn't close the door, he wouldn't speak to me for a month. So I let the end of the blanket fall and sat down on the grass in front of the tent. Joyce poked her head out and said in a sugary white woman in the movie's voice, baby, you go get some wood. Daddy and I are going to light a fire. Then I'm going to make you some cake. Then her voice changed as if she was going to hit me. Go! Get! Billy told me after that Joyce had hairs on her thing and that she had gotten them from doing it with so many boys. She even had hair under her arms, both of them. He was very proud of her accomplishments. As their love affair progressed, his stealing from the store increased. 
We had always taken candy and a few nickels and, of course, the sour pickles, but barely now called upon to feed Joyce's ravening, hun ravening hunger, took cans of sardines and greasy Polish sausage and cheese and even the expensive cans of pink salmon that our family could sell them afford to eat. Joyce's willingness to do our job slackened about this time. She complained that she wasn't feeling all that well, but since she now had a few coins, she still hung around the store, eating planters peanuts and drinking Dr. Pepper. Mama ran her off a few times. Ain't you said you wasn't feeling well, Joyce? Had you better get home and let your auntie do something for you? Yes, ma'am. Then reluctantly, she was off the porch, her stiff-legged walk carrying her up the hill and out of sight. I think she was Bailey's first love outside the family. For him, she was the mother who let him get as close as he dreamed, the sister who wasn't moody and withdrawing and teary and tender-hearted. All he had to do was keep the food coming in, and she kept the affection flowing. It made no difference to him that she was almost a woman, or possibly it was just that difference which made her so appealing. She was around for a few months, and as she had appeared out of limbo, so she disappeared into nothingness. There was no gossip about her, no clues to her leaving her or her whereabouts. I noticed a change in Bailey before I discovered that she was gone. He lost his interest in everything. He mauled around and it would be safe to say he paled. Mama noticed and said that he was feeling poorly because of the change in seasons. We were nearing fall, so she went to the woods for certain leaves, made him a tea and forced him to drink it after a heaping spoonful of sulfur and molasses. The fact that he didn't fight it, didn't try to talk his way out of taking the medicine, showed without a glimmer of doubt that he was very sick. If I had disliked Joyce while she had Bailey in her grasp, I hated her for leaving. I missed the tolerance she had brought to him. He had nearly given up sarcasm and playing jokes on the country people, and he had taken to telling me his secrets again. But now that she was gone, he rivaled me in being uncommunicative. He closed in upon himself like a pond swallowing a stone. There was no evidence that he had ever opened up. And when I mentioned her, he responded with Joyce who? Months later, when mama was waiting on Joyce's aunt, she said, yes, ma'am. Mrs. Goodman likes just one thing right after the other. Mrs. Goodman was leaning on the red Coca-Cola box. That's the blessed truth, Sister Henderson. She sipped the expensive drink Things change so fast and make your head swim. That was mama's way of opening up a conversation. I stayed mouse quiet so that I'd be able to hear the gossip and take it to Billy. Now you take little Joyce. She used to be around the store all the time. Then she went up just like smoke. We ain't seen hide nor hair of her in months. No, my shame to tell you. What took her off? She settled in on the kitchen chair. Mama spied me in the shadows. Sister, the Lord don't like little jugs with big ears. You ain't got something to do. I'll find something for you. The truth had to float to me through the kitchen door. I ain't got much, Sister Henderson, but I give that child all I had. Mama said she bound that was true. She wouldn't say bet. And after all I did, she run off at one of those rare world porters. She was loose just like her mammy before her. You know how they say, blood will tell. Mama asked, how did the snake catch her? Well, now, understand me, Sister Henderson. 
I don't hold this against you. I know you a God-fearing woman, but it seems like she met him here. Mama was flustered. Goings on at the store? And asked, at the store? Yes, ma'am. Remember when a bunch of elves come over for their baseball game? Mama must have remembered. I did. Well, as it turned out, he was one of them. She left me a teeny easy note. Said people in stamps thought they were better than she was, and that she hadn't only made that she hadn't only made one friend, and that was your grandson. Said she was moving to Dallas, Texas, and going to marry that railroad porter. Mama said, "Do Lord." Mrs. Goodman said, "You know, Sister Henderson." She wasn't with me long enough for me to get the real habit of her, but still I miss her. She was sweet when she wanted to be. Mama consoled her with, well, we got to keep our mind on the works of the book. It say, the Lord giveth and the Lord taketh away. Mrs. Goodman chimed in and they finished the phrase together. Blessed be the name of the Lord. I don't know how Bailey had, I don't know how long Bailey had known about Joyce, but later in the evening, when I tried to bring her name into conversation, he said, Joyce, she's got somebody to do it to her all the time now. And that was the last time her name was mentioned. This is the end of the reading. Or I Know Why the Caged Bird Sings by Maya Angelou. And I have read for your hearing chapters 19, 20, and 21. Thank you for listening.